Welcome to People in Profit. I'm Kate Moody. My guest today is Emmanuel Faber, former CEO of Danone and now a partner at the impact investor Astinor Ventures, which focuses on agri-food technology. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, you have long called for the private sector to play more of a role in the fight against climate change. You recently attended the COP26 summit in Glasgow. Do you think businesses stepped up enough? <laughs> Thank you, Kate, for having me. Uh, I, I think the simple answer is no, uh, and I don't think anyone has yet stepped up enough at this stage. But people and companies are moving. What were you hoping to see that you didn't at COP26? Well, I think we are yet to have a full alignment on the net zero by 2050. And we have even less of an alignment on how to get there, meaning what is the agenda for business, for finance, for governments, uh, for 2030, really. And actually, you know that uh, the carbon decarbonation trajectories are um, to be reviewed every five years. I personally believe that five years is way too long, given where we are right now. We should actually review them every year in the next five years. And uh, what gave me hope, really, was the fact that um, we soon will have carbon metrics to start with uh, for the global financial markets, uh, which I think is one of the highlights of this, uh, of this COP as well. Now, sustainability has been a central theme of your career, really. Uh, while you were at Danone, you brought in a concept known as carbon-adjusted earnings per share. Why do you think that isn't something that's being embraced more broadly? Well, I, I think one of uh, the magic about agriculture and food, and that's also one of the reasons for me joining uh, such a thought leader uh, and pioneering company as Astano Ventures, is um, agriculture is a big part of emissions, as much as industry, basically, 20 to 25 percent of uh, the carbon uh, emissions overall, um, 30, 40 percent uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. But unlike energy, uh, agriculture has this magic ability that it can actually put carbon back into the soil through a change in the agricultural practices by using both uh, agroecology, uh, organic farming, uh, regenerative farming, and technology. And uh, this is essentially what we have been doing at Danone for the last uh, 13 years uh, now. Lots of other companies have now started. And I think it was easier for uh, the agriculture-based and the food companies than it may have been for others because we have this ability to invest in what will be the resilience of farming tomorrow, which means putting carbon back into the soil. Uh, and that's why we decided uh, to uh, indeed release an IFRS uh, uh, EPS, earning per share, that has been adjusted by uh, a notional charge in our accounts for the scope three emissions of carbon of the whole company, including agriculture. And that was really interesting in the conversation that it sparkled with our investors because it really meant that if we were going to pay dividend above that uh, adjusted number, it meant that we didn't even had enough money to invest for the resilience of our business model and put carbon back in the fields because all over the place, agriculture is ruining the soil health through monoculture and intensive and badly used subsidies. The complexity so far has been that for other sectors, the carbon externality is not as easy as it is in many ways. And I quote and quote when I say easy, but there is no sort of uh, business linked direct pathway to decarbonize uh, those, those industries. And in addition to that, I think the, we, are, we have been the only company so far in doing so because there was no metrics. There was no, we, we had to go for our own metric and engage with our stakeholders and, and, and uh, shareholders with that. Now, in two years' time, there will be IFRS and EU metrics on climate, including carbon scope three emissions, that will allow companies and investors to have a true and honest discussions on data that have been audited. And that will be a huge change. Now, your time at Danone and specifically your departure earlier this year does highlight the challenges that companies are facing, uh, trying to maintain their market share and growth trajectory while bringing in a more sustainable outlook. 
No, I don't think that has uh, anything to do with that. Uh, it was a board governance issue which uh, has nothing to do with the performance uh, of the company or uh, its resilience in, in the system. Um, I would, uh, you know, echo basically a lot of other companies now that are embracing regenerative agriculture. Nestle has announced that by 2030, uh, they would have a global footprint of regenerative agriculture. At the last UN Food Summit, uh, a month and a half ago, PepsiCo, who is also part of a coalition that we created on regenerative agriculture and biodiversity, also said that they would turn entirely now to regenerative agriculture over time by co-financing with farmers uh, these resilience of their uh, uh, business system. So it's simply that um, this is now, uh, I think, a whole industry that realizes that we depend on nature, so we need to take care of it. And when it comes to agriculture, the basis, the mother of it all is carbon, because carbon is basically 60% of the organic matter in the soil. So that's where everything starts. Are shareholders across the board perhaps getting more on the same page as you are when it comes to ESG or uh, environmental, social and governance priorities, do you think? Is there a shift that we're seeing? Yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's very clear. It's both quantitative and qualitative. I've been invited um, already two, three years ago and uh, regularly ever since by very large investors, pension funds, U.S. pension funds, uh, to meet with their boards. Uh, meaning the people that are actually giving them their money under management. So I met, you know, the heads of Harvard uh, University, the heads of Rockefeller Foundations and many others that are actually putting their money at work uh, through these large investment funds. And they are questioning and they are asking those uh, entities, how do they manage those funds? Do they have their own decarbonation pathway as an investor? And um, you, you can see already today that a number of investors are just walking away of, of, from of the most uh, you know, uh, fossil energy and, and polluters uh, systems like coal, for instance, which is a huge topic of conversation. Um, that needs to be taken care of properly, but you can see already that investors are walking away from that. If they walk away from these industries, it means the cost of capital of these industries is going to rise. And therefore, it means that relative to that cost of capital, investing in renewable energy is going to be less costly. And so, yes, there is a shift. And again, the fact that um, we, we will have uh, IFRS and EU norms, standards on carbon emissions will mean that not only companies will have to report to their stakeholders and to the shareholders, but also the shareholders themselves, the funds will be able to calculate the performance of their portfolio of companies uh, in terms of carbon, not only in terms of profit. And when they will be asked by those very customers that are putting their money under management, uh, they will be able to compare which fund has actually been better in uh, uh, having a decarbonation track. So, yes, it's a long answer to say, yes, finance is, is moving. It's not moving fast enough. I think it continues to pretend it moves fast than, you know, faster than what it does, that funds available are bigger than what they truly are for those uh, uh, topics overall. But I think that's part of the overall game. And I think metrics will allow to reduce uh, the greenwashing noise uh, that goes beyond the reality. But the reality is truly moving. So what do you say to critics who say that may, many major corporations are engaged in greenwashing, making big public promises but not necessarily following through, uh, or still putting money into projects that are bad for the environment? Well, putting projects that are bad for the environment is unfortunately something that we will need to continue looking at carefully because of the fact that not everyone starts from the same page. And there will not be a climate transition if there is not a social transition. There will not be climate justice without social justice. And there are people that just can't afford the today still very expensive renewable energies. There are not people that can actually afford the fact that we do not pay overall the true cost of food 
you know, the simple fact that we are not investing in the so soil that are eroded means we do not pay the true cost. So tomorrow, the cost of food is likely to increase. Tomorrow, the cost of energy is likely to increase. So you need to make sure that those people that are most vulnerable to climate change, that are most vulnerable to the changes in the industry that's going to come from, from a workforce and a skill standpoint, from an access from, you know, food and water and others, are supported collectively. And this is where, unfortunately, maybe, quote unquote, there's still a need to consider the continuation of some uh, not uh, environmental positive solutions, provided they are really targeted at solving the transition. They cannot be part of the long-term future. They need to be part of the transition. So this is to say it's not a simple topic. It's a complex topic in which we need to balance uh, the social, the economic, and the environmental aspects of it. But I think, uh, uh, nevertheless, fully embrace the fact that we need to disrupt our business models. And when I say we, I specifically speak about leaders uh, today in the political, in the economic, in the finance uh, uh, areas that need to really uh, uh, move the needle in their organizations, their companies, and in particular for us citizens of the OECD who have, uh, uh, as we all know, the biggest footprint uh, from an environmental standpoint uh, that any human uh, people have on earth. Before I let you go, what's the biggest change that you think consumers can expect to see in the food industry over the coming years? Uh, more local food. I think whether we like it or not, I think uh, there will be a relocalization of uh, the food systems uh, for political reasons. I mean, the, the pandemic has shown that sovereignty on food was a huge political topic for governments. Uh, second, because we see that the uh, very complex interdependence of the food system overall is an element of fragility, and we've seen it in the pandemic. And third, because climate change is hurting local agriculture. And this is where technology, uh, where relocalizing, looking at how technology can support uh, nature, farmers, and consumers at the end, uh, enhancing their ability to uh, really root uh, food systems back into local agricultural conditions, I think is a fundamental part of the future. So expect more local food and hopefully enjoy more local food. Emmanuel Faber of Astenor Ventures, thank you so much for being with us on People and Profit today. And thank you for watching. Don't forget you can get in touch with your comments and questions on social media. Stay tuned to France 24.